Great. So welcome everyone to this latest edition of the Princeton Wireless Distinguished Seminar Series. Uh, today we are uh, really fortunate to have Onur Sahin from InterDigital with us uh, today. Uh, Onur received his BS in Electrical and Electronics Engineering from Middle East Technical University in Ankara in 2003 and a PhD from NYU in 2009. And Onur is a member of the technical staff at InterDigital Europe um, in London. And so uh, wishing him a, a good evening. Um, he's the author of uh, over 45 peer-reviewed scientific articles, co-inventor of 35 patents and patent applications, and uh, co-recipient of, of numerous uh, best paper awards in uh, the Signal Processing Society and the uh, Journal of uh, Communication uh, Networks. And today, um, Ona will be talking about emerging pillars and vision for beyond 5G and 6G wireless communications. And so with that, I'll hand it over to you, Ona. Thank welcome. you very much, Kyle. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be with you, everyone. And, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'll share my screen. Um, please let me know if you see that and I put it on presentation mode. I think we're good to go. I minimize this window. Oh, we're good, okay, yeah. perfect. Excellent. Okay, thank you again uh, for the invitation. Uh, just quick note here. I'm based in London. Hi to everyone from London. It's a particularly rainy day. Uh, today, uh, we are really in the middle of the dark winter. Um, and um, I got my PhD from NYU and my advisor, Professor Elza Erkip, she was on sabbatical at Princeton, I believe 2007 or 2008. And I had the honor to spend uh, quite a few Fridays at your beautiful campus uh, to visit my professor and attend your seminars when I was a PhD student. So uh, it's, it's particularly enjoyable. Uh, on that regard to the video. So thank you again. So yeah, uh, the title of the talk is Emerging Pillars, as Karen mentioned, and Vision for Beyond 5G, 6 to Wireless Communications. And um, it will be a in the industry perfection, not much scientific stuff in presentation, to be frank. It's mainly review or, or reflection from industry. I thought that might be helpful to you all. Uh, if you can see the light dish um, when you know uh, you listen to me. Um, so before the presentation, a very brief intro about the company, Interdigital. Uh, most of you may not even have heard of the company's name, but um, to be fair, actually, it uh, you know geographically. Uh, uh, so uh, the offices, the key engineering offices are fairly close to Prince. Uh, one, uh, one is in the Philadelphia area. Uh, the other one used to be in Long Island, New York, and recently moved to Manhattan, New York City. Um, so it's a research and development company and a licensing company. It's been around for about 40 years. And the key innovation, the, the key area of focus has been innovating or innovations in wireless technologies. And uh, the company had a significant investment recently to expand into visual technologies, multimedia, uh, video uh, technologies, and AI. Um, and it's been the industry, it's been one of the recognized leaders in research and licensing. So a bit of stats, about 60% of our employees are engineers. Uh, we have about 600 employees in the company and 90% of the engineers are inventors, inventors in that regard, meaning they are named in, um, in uh, granted patents uh, by US office or, or uh, European office. Uh, more than 20% of our an annual revenue uh, is directly invested in research and development, which is a huge, uh, a considerable portion, um, and which is normal being an R&D company. Companies about 80 licensees, including Apple, Huawei, Samsung, pretty much any major, any major uh, smartphone vendor. Okay, so uh, I mentioned about the core business. Uh, historically, the core business has been wireless, cellular communications, Wi-Fi, and now uh, a great chunk is also AI research and visual technologies. And obviously being um, a forefront R&D company, emerging areas are as relevant to us and we have uh, similar uh, interest and investments ongoing. So namely quantum computing is an important area for us uh, with, with our investments, also edge computing and synthetic content and virtual uh, wireless AI. Uh, 
Um, so the business model. So when I explain this research company and it's it's a it's a, a private company, the business model uh, is is a very unique one. And uh, in the center of the business model is the standards. So uh, when I mean standards, I'm talking about pretty much any everything you know, uh, meaning or technologies or 5G technologies or in, in uh, for indoor community, indoor uh, techno wireless technology, Wi-Fi or any technologies for visual community, uh, for visual, um, uh, visual uh, multimedia applications, so on and so forth. So as a company, Standards is our platform where we provide or contribute with our innovations. And we have a lot of several uh, leadership positions in the standards, 3GP, IEEE, IIT, so on and so forth. So we basically uh, push our uh, solutions, innovations, technologies for the problems that we observe in standardizations. So what do standards do? They actually improve all devices. It's not a particular product or model per se, but whatever goes into standards includes all devices and services that is in the market. So if you think about a cell phone, instead of optimizing or innovating for one company, whatever we innovate goes into standards and whichever phone is granted or stamped by 5G standard uh, tag, then uh, it uses our technology. So in that regard, pretty much all uh, smartphones have been using into digital technologies over, over many years. And uh, when we do that, obviously companies do not become our, our customers directly, but we sell our ideas, innovations to engineers and research peers because they need to be accepted in standardization. What that implies is that success is very much based on the quality of the research. Uh, and are involved in standardization, um, not necessarily commercial cloud. Uh, one observation for this type of business model, uh, standards, they absolutely reward long-term commitment. It's very, very unlikely to get return on investment in, in the short term uh, for multiple reasons. It takes significant amount of time for innovations to take part in standards because standard cycles tend to be long, one year, two years, three years, four years, etc., and to be really engaged with standardization phase in order your innovations uh, be part of, of that particular standard. Uh, I already mentioned so about eighty customers. Uh, most of them um, who have been under license, uh, they continue uh, being our licensees. Uh, we're talking about 20 plus years time frame here. And even Apple and Samsung, before they shipped their very first iPhone and Galaxy phones, they were our licensees and they continue to be so. And most recently, uh, Interdigital has been seeing considerable success uh, with China-based vendors, uh, namely Huawei, Xiaomi, ZT, et cetera. Okay. So that's a bit of uh, information about interdigital. Now, uh, next generation cellular or next, next generation wireless technology. So when I say next generation is next, uh, so is 5G done? So what I mean is the 6G uh, and the vision and requirements. So it's been a long journey for telco industry. Obviously a lot of you probably were not involved with most of them. Uh, but um, the starting point of it is the 1G, the analog era, connecting um, these bulky phones uh, with, with, with the huge transmitters. And then comes the 2G digital era in 90s. That is the real, one of the real revolutions uh, in, in, in our ecosystem, in industry. And then comes the 3G, where we first put the internet or the attempt to put internet to every mobile phone and the real success in 4G where, which served as a springboard in a way for all these applications that we have been using because 4G was able to put video and multimedia to internet connectivity on, on the smartphones. Um, so there is a semi-serious joke in industry that goes on uh, saying that all patients actually are division setters and even generations are the doers and implementers. And if you look at what has been promised and what has been done in terms of done meaning, 
the uh, corresponding application services come to life or we to use databases, there is a bit of truth to that. So now we talk about 5G. So what is 5G or to start with what was 5G? 5G, the initial premise of 5G uh, was actually a very bold statement. Uh, 5G is started with an attempt of service centric technology. So traditionally in 4G, 3G, et cetera, one cellular connectivity, and we try to improve that cellular connectivity as much as we could. But 5G said, okay, we need to enable or, or uh, really of start new applications, not necessarily cellular connectivity. So in that regard, they looked at three uh, rather distinctive uh, use cases. The first one is a traditional one, enhanced mobile broadband. Um, it's our cellular phones connected to uh, cell towers, etc. cetera. And uh, the, uh, the KPIs, performance indicators have been pushed significantly like gigabit per second required for 5G. And the reason being, Okay, we would like to enable the very next generation multimedia applications, the first attempt of augmented reality or ultra high definition screens, etc. So it has been the first application 5G as promised. The second one <clears throat> is more IoT type uh, technology framework, machine, massive machine type communications, rather connecting thousands of sensors with each other in a very unified uh, framework. And uh, some of the applications have been, for instance, smart city applications or smart home building applications. That's at the other end. Why is it at the other end? Because the requirements of MMTC, mass information that communications are considerably different than enhanced mobile broadband. And then at the other end, 5G promised that under its umbrella, it will enable or provide ultra low, low latency communications. When ultra low, low latency, the initial attempt, the initial principle was, okay, can we really replace cables? So think about a wireless technology as reliable or as low latency as a fiber connectivity, for instance. That was the attempt that was the old vision and the enabling, what will that enable? That is actually a must have for self driving cars, right? So, if two cars communicating with each other, self driving, they should have almost lossless, loss free, and almost zero latency communication. So, that was the bold attempt of, of 5G. Where are we? <clears throat> Obviously, not necessarily it's an old numbered generation. Uh, most of the premises are not there yet. Uh, as of today, we are working on the design of 5G uh, Advance, 5G A. <coughs> Sorry. But um, some of the visions, um, the rollout and the services and applications uh, will come into our daily lives, hopefully in the upcoming couple of years. But at the moment, we are just not there yet. It is just the beginning of 5G deployments. However, the research of 5G, the initial 5G has been concluded. Now we are doing the enhancements on 5G on this 5G vision. Excuse me. So um, now we have uh, in the industry, we have already started the discussion of 6G. You might be asking, okay, you know, 5G is not still delivered. Why are we having the discussion of 5G, 6G already? Uh, there are multiple reasons. It, as it has been in every generation. So there are mega trends underpinning this. The first one is a very strong one in 6G is the stakeholders race for 6G research leadership. So it's a market trend, but what we mean by stakeholders is fairly unique to 6G. <clears throat> the biggest stakeholder in this case is the governments. So first time United States has been pushing really hard to be at the forefront of 6G because uh, you know, quoting them, suggesting that they have been extremely far behind in 5G technologies compared to other countries. Same for China, same for European Union, where I'm based in. So there is huge push uh, among the governments to be at the forefront of the 6G research and leadership. I'm so sorry. 
Hi, Honor. Um, hey. We're getting a, a few audio problems. I wonder if you could stop your video and that might um, make oh, your audio sure. cleaner. Thanks. Let me know how it is now. So far, so good. I'm also having a bit of uh, audio problem, but it's more like, <laughs> you know, I think the copy and stuff. So I apologize for that. Uh, the second the second push is the um, the, the trend is the momentum uh, for support of more verticals. <clears throat> the more we deploy 4G and 5G, the more verticals get to realize that actually they need particular connectivity solutions for themselves. And the biggest momentum here is coming from industry for that all. So industry for that all customers, in other words, they request or they come and I will discuss the platform where it is discussed. They come and request particular connectivity solutions that would fulfill their requirements in, industry, in, in factory setups, mission to mission communications, so on and so forth. The third demand is <clears throat> obviously we have abundant amount of data in, in communication networks and uh, which we have not used much, actually we have used at all. So with the progress in AI ML, um, both in software and hardware, the, one of the questions is, okay, can we use abundant amount of data, structured or unstructured data in our networks for various objectives? So the first, the fourth one is the virtualization and disaggregation. One of the disruptions of 5G has been that there was virtualization pretty much in every corner of the core network. So we've seen cloudification, we've seen Facebook's, Google's entering in the telco systems, which is quite unique because they have been Amazon as well because of the cloudification of the online core network and the segregation of otherwise uh, mono, monolithic nodes. Now, uh, this has been pushing into even closer to the cell phones, to end users, like radio access networks, as they call, which is the network between the core network and the user that contains base stations, antennas, etc. <clears throat> and the fourth drive is obviously the new spectrum that has been opening up. And here there is also a tech trend, but there is also uh, support by governments and regulators to open up otherwise unavailable spectrum. Okay, try to move, yeah. So one question I had when I was a PhD student, okay, everybody's talking about 3G, 4G, et cetera, but who gives these names? So it is actually fairly structured how it happens. So these standardization names are given by United Nations. In the United Nations, there is an organization called ITU, National Telecommunications Union. And every 10 years, roughly, ITU asks, um the stakeholders okay um i to grant a new generation i will uh, ask you to come up with some requirements that i will pose for instance in 2020 which is 5g i am to 2020 and years but it suggested that the use cases that we envision for 2020 are as such and in order to enable those use cases you need to come up with a technology that satisfies particular data rates, latency, number of connections, so on and so forth. So in the last 10 years, uh, as industry, 3GPP mainly has uh, put significant efforts by various companies, hundreds of companies and some academic institutions as well to come up with the 5G specification to satisfy the requirements of IMT 2020. And by February 2021, ITU simply amended and granted the 5G tag to GPP uh, standardization. TDSI is the Indian version of 5G technology, which is a national specification. Now, same organization, ITUR, is working on uh, the requirements or technology trends for 2030 timeframe, which will be the 60. So um, what is happening at the moment, same organization is asking stakeholders and stakeholders in that regard are industry participants, governments, uh, academia, universities, et cetera, or individual contributors to come up with the technology trends that they foresee in the timeline of 2030. 
and this will be released in June 2022. And this is a very critical stage for all of us because it will also imply what kind of requirements we will need to fulfill for six technologies. And it will give us the innovation opportunities, the challenges, the problems going forward. Oops, yeah. Um, so um, this effort has been going on for some time, for about a year and a half now uh, under ITU. And we have already started seeing some of the use cases convert. The first one is actually, these are not very surprising. We had these use cases in 5G as well, but in 6G, they came to become more concrete and uh, seem to be much more realistic to achieve in 5G timeframe. The first one is the multi-sensory extended reality and haptics, uh, which is pretty much, you could view that as human computer interaction, communication, connectivity. The second one is a very, actually, it's been around for, for quite, you know, quite many years, volumetric media streaming, it's 3D uh, media streaming, basically. Uh, the third one, again, a fairly well-known one, connected industries and automation, obviously each with stringent two requirements. The fourth one is autonomous vehicles and so on systems. And the fifth one is extreme co coverage and reaching the last billion. So all of these use cases actually uh, come to daylight after a lot of discussions, a lot of predictions uh, and negotiations in a way that it is uh, part of the IMT 2030. So it's a busy slide. I'm not going to uh, go over every flow here, obviously. But what I wanted to show is research as engineers. Uh, it is very critical for us to see what the problems, what the technical challenges will be. So in terms of spectrum, again, 5G technologies, we were moving up to 100 gigahertz spectrum. So in 5G currently, um, the technology we develop is in the order of 52.6 gigahertz, but 5G advance has already moved up to 70 to 90 gigahertz. So 5G will be covering spectrum up to 100 gigahertz. But in IMT 2030, 6G, the carrier frequencies are actually almost agreed that they will move up to 300 gigahertz. So we'll be in the sub terahertz regime for 6G. Uh, I would like to pay, I would like to show the peak data rate requirements between 5G. Uh, the peak data rate in 5G was, is expected to be 20 gigabit per second. And we have designed solutions supporting this in the spec, but critically, very critical, uh, in 6G peak data rates will have to go up to terabit per second. Again, these will be the requirements that we have to achieve. It's not just um, a white paper. It, these are the requirements we will have to achieve to get the 6G tag. And the last one I would like to show is the energy efficiency. 5G, we did not have particular energy efficiency requirements. They were very qualitative, but in 6G, <clears throat> it is required that compared to 5G, terminal energy efficiency should be 100 times better, and the network energy efficiency should be 1,000 times better. But that's more for the carbon emission and the uh, the amount of energy lost, which is huge in telco industry. So um, once again, um, the reason we're looking at these requirements is that it gives us indication where the research challenges are. So this type of heat map helps us a lot. We do that in every generation. So compared to 5G, the challenge is from I, and it identifies, it gives us identifying the core innovation areas. So just, just for instance, if we take one of the primary use cases, which is multi-sensory XR, and if you look at the user data rate, we are expecting 20 times more data rates compared to 5G. Or if we take Molvetic media, which is media, which is another primary use case, where we observe that we have to achieve more than 100 times the rate. So these are all extreme design challenges. Similarly for connected industry, in, the, in this one, reliability becomes very critical. 
5G reliability figures should be 100 improved 100 times than what it is today and connection density 10 times and positioning, which is primary um, in 6G, it has to be improved almost 100 times. So 5G will surely be challenged by these cases. So going forwards, okay. So as industry at the moment, we are fairly observing fairly in a good state to observe where the challenges are, uh, but we need to identify the enabling technologies uh, to see what we might use to solve these challenges. So in the upcoming couple of slides, I will very briefly discuss what these enabling te te technologies are that have been surfacing recently to solve these challenges. And then just a couple of them, I will very high level mention where we are, what the challenges are, uh, how we can leverage them to, to solve the breaking points of 5G. So uh, again, every generation has its own, own trends, tools, so to say, in, in beyond 5G, 6G, we get to observe that uh, some of them are much more obvious now. The first one is the knee bands and models, pushing into knee bands and sharing models. Um, I have a slide on that one. Uh, doing communications and sensing, integrating communications and sensing together, extreme virtualization to the extent that even devices today, mobile phones will be part of the virtualization. We will not have a dedicated hardware or software. Uh, wireless AI fusion, it's very primary. The configurable surfaces, I know Kyle has been doing work on this, uh, and spectral to energy efficiency. So we observed that as these six areas uh, have huge potential to solve some of these breaking points of, of 5G. So first one, pushing into the spectrum and sharing models. Uh, first of all, uh, the use cases, just looking at the use cases from ultra throughput required for XR to next generation infrastructure, et cetera, uh, terahertz, sub-terahertz links uh, spectrum will be uh, one of the primary data carriers going forward. And as we speak today, as I mentioned, in 3GPP in 5G, 72 to 100 gigahertz, it's already almost a mature technology in the sense that we have a specification, we know how it works, we have RF transceivers, we have baseband, so on and so forth. Um, in terms of midterm, when I say midterm, it's three to five years or even longer than I mean, at the first releases of 6G in a way. Uh, between 100 gigahertz and 300 gigahertz, there is lab grade reference designs already, mainly coming from academia. And we believe that they will pick up and industry will pick this up and put this into more usable, practical uh, products and solutions. And going all the way to 6G, 10 years from today, maybe less, 300 plus spectrum will be possibly uh, our, our, uh, one of the de facto uh, carrier, carrier bands. So what might break in 5G? Uh, the potential is high because all the digital design that we know of for 5G actually in a way fail for these type of frequencies. Uh, why? I have, a, I have a couple of slides on that because of the underlying hardware issues, because of the underlying computation issues, because of the underlying power issues. And the impact will be probably a new revisit of the connectivity baseband solutions and also even uh, the integration of RF transceivers with the underlying uh, digital communication solutions. Again, I have a slide on that, so I'll, very, I'll, I'll skip that one for now. The second trend is the fusion of wires and networking with AI ML. Um, actually in 5G, we are using machine learning in core and edge networks, in higher layers. It is part of the uh, orchestration. It's been standardized. We have standardized interfaces in a network, how the data, training data is obtained, how the models are exchanged between these nodes. But this is mainly in the core and edge network, mainly in the self-organized network and orchestration manner. So in the midterm, we observe that there's a lot of small data in radio access networks in particular. And we have not been using these automated methods for the middle layers. When I say middle layer, think about OSI layer. Uh, we have the uh, air interface at the bottom, all the way to service layer at the top, seven layer OSI model. Um, in the upper layers, we've been using AIML for sure, and in the core network. But in the lower layers, we still have 
and crafted uh, model-based solutions. So going forward, we expect that the middle layers, the MAC layer, medium access control, RRC, radio control, will surely benefit of, of the automated AIML models uh, solutions because of so much data, small data we have at hand. In the longer term, our vision is that actually it's been now pretty much um, uh, accepted or, or by, uh, bought in by, by many players in the industry is that it will probably play into almost every layer in the OSI stack, including the physical layer. Um, and the potential to break 5G as we have the solution is huge. The reason is that 5G is based on model-based design. We have underlying mathematical models. We have a noise model, we have channel model, um, we have deployment models, everything. And all solutions we have are based on uh, these models. So uh, once we have database data, -based data uh, driven optimization or design, all the control signaling, all the layering between these protocols will have to be revisited. So uh, we believe that the potential to break 5G is huge. The third one, very briefly, convergence of communications and region positioning. Uh, the motivation is very simple. We have wireless signals all over, which we use for data communication. Think about your Wi-Fi router, it's sending wireless signals, and it's mainly sending signals or to convey data. The question is, why do not we use them for other purposes? For instance, sensing to sense and, uh, things in the environment or position. So of course there are technolo radar technologies doing that, but combining radar principles and communication principles in one technology actually has started picking up recently in the industry. Um, so, in the shorter term, as we speak, there is already a huge effort under Wi-Fi standardization. It's called ATOR.11DF, which started looking into how to, how to process Wi-Fi signals for various applications like gate recognition, fall detection, proximity detection, etc. But in that one, the wireless signals or protocols are not changed much. So the signals are not changed at all, but there is a bit of optimization in the protocol. So in the midterm, we expect to see a more integrated communication and sensing technology. Um, so a bit more mature standard. And in the long term, we expect that a communic there will not be only one signal, which either does communication or sensing, but that signal and the underlying control plane deployments as such that will enable joint communication and sensing in a seamless fashion. Uh, and the, 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 the trend or uh, the potential to break 5G, as we know, it's, it's also huge because that implies change in the waveform. That implies change in the actual transmission of the signal shape. Um, so the ramifications will be all the way to how the signal accesses the channel, how does a user communicates with the other or, or senses the other. And, and a joint optimization between sensing and communications. And the last one here is the re reconfigurable intelligent metasurfaces. Um, so it has been one of the hottest topics, as, as you might already know. Uh, what it does is basically, instead of seeing a channel as a passive environment, these reflective surfaces, if you see my cursor, they actually program the environment. So in the fashion that it might optimize how the signal is transmitted and received between two nodes. So far, we did not have it. We simply have, we simply have, um, not simply, but uh, the balancing of the signals, reflection, reflection of the signals based on the environment, but we have not had the opportunity or technology to optimize how they are reflected or reflected from particular surfaces. So in the shorter term, uh, we expect that in the, um, in the notion of more like massive MIMA type um, systems, which we have a lot of technology at hand, a lot of knowledge, and probably bands going up to 50 gigahertz. <clears throat> but in the, in the midterm, uh, we expect that to expand all the way to multi gigahertz uh, per second links, thanks to programmability of the environment and that will also enable us some high resolution localization. And in the longer term, we're talking about quite uh, stringent requirements of 
of terahertz bands uh, and 100 gigabit per second frequencies enabling holographic IMO even wireless power transfer below one gigahertz. <clears throat> So uh, how it relates to 5G, it's also the potential to break 5G is very huge because we see that that is the, probably the last missing piece in softwareization of a network. So we have been soft making every node as a software-based um, deployment, but the channel we could not touch so far but with the reflective surfaces, we are able to program the channel as well. So everything is becoming a software in a way. Um, and obviously the implications from physical layer all the way from physical layer to network design is tremendous of this technology. So, uh, so far uh, I mentioned about, just to recap, I mentioned about uh, the use cases that are surfacing for 6G or the industry and academia or stakeholders have been converging. Of course it will change, but we that's the broad strokes of the vision. And then some of the key enablers that again, industry ecosystem has been discussing a lot uh, how to enable those use cases based on the limitations, based on the limitations of 5G and the technical gaps that we have identified. So uh, here in the upcoming couple of slides, I just want to mention, uh, dig a bit deeper into one of those technologies or one of the enablers and how we, how we actually solve some of the challenges that we have observed. That is the sub terahertz and terabit per second wireless. So I have already motivated this wide terahertz spectrum, terabit per second throughputs will be, again, they will be the requirement and every observation we see, if you look at the trend, all the way from 95 to today, there is a steady increase of the data rates that technologies are given. These are actually user demands. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the market demand. It's like the user push in a way. Um, and um, no wonder that around 2030, these data we will start already talking about terabit per second. And the only bands that give us, unless we have a breakthrough in physics in the upcoming five years, uh, is that the only break, uh, the only enabler bands for these data rates will be in the order of terahertz. When I, the industry, again, just uh, to, to maybe clear up some, some um, un, unclear points, when we say terahertz, we also include sub terahertz bands, which is 100 gigahertz and above um, in, in when we discuss terahertz. And uh, yeah, we will need terahertz technology, terahertz bands, but the good news is that we have huge spectrum available above 250 gigahertz that, uh, that will help us achieve 100 gigabit per second and higher throughputs. And there is even an initial attempt of a standard for these bands. And recently uh, ITU has started allocating these bands is for us to experiment and see what technologies we are able to achieve or, or develop. So spectrum wide, <clears throat> we are in good shape, but if we want to have a practical deployment or technology here, there are two missing components. The first one is a terahertz RF, um, which has been the most intense research area in terahertz communications over the last 20, 30 years with significant progress. I strongly recommend anyone interested to look at, the, to look at Middleman's paper for the review of RF, RF transceiver technology. And the second one, so when I say RF, uh, it includes everything from signal generation to analog to digital converter to antenna elements, uh, RF combining, etc. So that is the terahertz RF component. And now with uh, substantial progress in terahertz RF, uh, the other remaining uh, piece in the puzzle is the baseband the digital baseband communications. So uh, as you all know, a digital baseband is composed of multiple blocks, multiple modules. So it ranges from channel coding, forward, forward error correction technology, has modulation as one of the block. It has waveform multiplexing, um, MIMO in some cases, and initial access, so on and so forth. <clears throat> in this digital block, digital, chain, baseband chain, FEC, for their correction, is the most complex module. 
in the uh, here in the baseband. So on the right hand side, uh, we show a reference design implementation, a practical implementation of 5G terminal. And uh, what, what it shows is that channel decoder consumes almost 50% of the overall power consumption. So uh, in order to enable a terabit per second link level technology, the question becomes obvious. We have to come up with a channel decoder. So that's how we approach this problem. We said, okay, terabit per second is a requirement and we need to come up with a technology. What is the bottleneck to enable that technology? We looked at the analysis, very thorough detailed analysis. We did our analysis that uh, well, we've seen that actually channel coding will probably the bottleneck, the decoder and encoder blocks to enable that technology. And uh, if you look at over the last 30 years, FEC has really benefited a lot from silicon scaling all the way from 2G to 3G. We had 180 nanometer nodes. Now we have 10 and even Apple's latest phone, as far as I know, is four nanometer silicon. So huge, huge benefit from, uh, from Moonstone. But are things, uh, you know, are we going to still benefit from same paradigms? Uh, not really, because what we know is that most law slowdown, it's not a speculation anymore. So we have started seeing the slowdown over the last couple of years already. Um, and not only that, the storage densities are slowing down as well. So it's quite a slow. Um, and uh, I guess one of the best, uh, sentences that captures all this is by Ahmed Bahai, a CTO of Texas Instruments in his uh, 2017 plenary talk. So beyond, beyond 5G will possibly be the era of increasing gaps. Um, as he notes, mobile data traffic is doubling every 16 months. Bandwidth efficiency, all these fancy signal processing techniques inventions that we come up, it's doubling bandwidth efficiency every 30 months. Transistor scaling now more slow, it's barely four years that we double transistor, it's not year and a half anymore. And the battery, which will also slow down even further and battery energy density doubling every six years. So uh, this trend has immediate impact in our digital baseband design and wireless R&D in general for 6G and beyond. Uh, to make it a bit more concrete, why that's a problem in 6G? Uh, let's look at these figures. So we did uh, the simple, very simple but realistic analysis here. So take a baseband system on a chip, which is in the order of 100 millimeters square. And typically, this could also, of course, change, but typically 10% is reserved for fact decoder. It's on your phone. If you open up your phone, you see this chipset. Um, and a very typical number for, for power, fact consumes is one watt. And again, in generations, it has not changed because it's, it's not related to battery technology or anything else. It's how the uh, circuitry is wrapped by plastics, the heat dissipation, so on and so forth. And let's look at the, and the throughput of these terabit per second. And all these rough numbers give us a framework for, for the design. So area limit 10 millimeters square, energy efficiency 100 gigabit per second per millimeter square, energy efficiency one picojoule per bit and power density. So here we plot that, the green, uh, uh, the green, uh, I think that, that is this Pentagon, <laughs> yeah. Um, the spider web shows the beyond 5G requirements and uh, the blue one shows us the 5G technology, the most advanced 5G technology. So here we see order of magnitude, almost 100 times improvement needed for throughput, same for energy efficiency, same for area efficiency, et cetera. Even when we include more slow projections, silicon node projections over the upcoming 10 years, we are still falling significantly behind all the requirements, at least 10 times uh, more than what we can achieve. Um, and power density is becoming a huge issue and energy efficiency stays almost the same uh, as a problem. So of course we have tools, we have solved these problems before in different generations. What we have used, we have used information theory, coding theory, we develop new codes, and also we did architectural designs, right? Architectural innovations. But now we are, at an inflicting point in the sense that these two tool sets are actually a bit contradictory or they give trade-offs. So in, if we want to implement an energy efficient high throughput architecture in a circuitry, obviously it requires large parallelism of the underlying algorithm. And also it would 
truly benefit from truly benefits from large regularity how we implement that in, in, in ASIC and large locality, right? But on the other hand, coding theory, on the contrary, benefits from randomness and no locality. So think about turbo code. We have interviewers just to randomize the incoming information stream and for LD, same for LDPC, tenograph. Uh, and the other observation is that a lot of decoding algorithms as we use today, they're inherently serial. So turbo decode decoding, it's inherently serial, polar successive cancellation, they are inherently serial. So I jumped ahead of myself actually, just to recap again. So if they're trying to solve this terabit per second problem, uh, encoder and decoder of fake technology, of course we have some tools, right? Um, the first one, turbo codes, uh, invented in 90s by Claude Barrow. Um, and uh, it, they were, these codes were the, uh, all the, the uh, standardized codes, codes in 3G and 4G. And then uh, LDPC codes by Bob Gallagher, invented in 60s, came back to life uh, around 2000. And now these are the codes that we use for 5G that replaced turbo codes in 5G. And the most recent codes by Erdo Larikan, invented late 2000s. And uh, very surprisingly, these codes are uh, in, in such, you know, in a very short amount of time since it's mentioned, it is part of the 5G standards. So in a remarkable advancement from theory into implementation and practice. Now 5G control channel, they are protected by polar codes. So we have these tools, toolboxes, and uh, let's look at polar codes. Uh, I'm not gonna go into technical details here, obviously, but polar codes is its newest code and it has huge potential and whether we can use them towards achieving our terabit per second challenges. Uh, just to recap, uh, most of you might have might be familiar with these codes, but uh, just to recap and set the stage here, uh, again, it was introduced by Arikan in 2007. It is the first provable capacity achieving channel code ever. Um, and has been adapted into GPP and our control channel as mentioned. And the main idea is, pre is called polarization. Instead of sending one bit um, to input bit and then outputting as output bit, uh, there is a simple XOR operation happening so that uh, the input bit, which we call effective bit channel is polarized in the sense that one channel becomes a bad channel because this information creates interference to the input bit one and the other channel becomes a good channel because the input directly goes into the output. So this simple idea can be extended to any number of input bits. And obviously as in every code, there are three stages, how we construct the code, how we encode the code and how we decode the code. Each of them uh, has been um, the focus of substantial research in academia and industry and, and standardization discussion. So for polar code construction, for instance, in, in 5G, we have agreed on a particular uh, code uh, indexing. So by indexing, what I mean is that with this polarization, we have to identify which bit locations are selected as frozen bits, which bit locations are selected as unfrozen. Unfrozen bits are where we have almost noise-free communication. So U6 almost in a noise-free fashion transmits, conveys its information to X, uh, X6, whereas the frozen bits are completely noise uh, corrupted by noise. So we simply do not send anything. We simply send zero. And at the decoder, these information are joint leverage to obtain the information that's unfrozen bit sequence. So the polar code construction, once it is done, in other words, identifying which nodes are selected as frozen and frozen, the next stage is polar encoding. Encoding is a simple, again, very simple, straightforward uh, generator matrix. Uh, we first combine these two bits. To, this is a two byte kernel. And then we combine two byte kernels into four by four. And then finally, these four by four are combined, as you see into the ultimate output stream. At the decoder, um, multiple uh, decoding techniques have been explored. Quick time check for me, sorry. Um, so successive cancellation, successive cancellation list and CA, CRCA did 
successive cancellation lists are actually the, the factor um, decoding algorithms using standards as well and belief propagation. So again, no need to go into detail, but what happens is uh, this is a decoder implementation. We have a polder code as such. Once it is received, um, it is fairly straightforward to convert this uh, structure into a factor tree. So, and this is nothing but a, a straightforward uh, tree optimization. So successive cancellation list is a search uh, algorithm. It's a depth first search. In other words, how do I obtain the values of uh, the bad channels and good channels so that they give me the ultimate uh, bit stream that was initially originally sent by the transmitter. So we receive the total bit streams and then using this factor tree, we identify the ultimate results outputs of, of the original uh, bit stream. So a lot of research has been carried out to identify these uh, depth free um, search algorithms, depth first, sorry, depth first and breadth first search algorithms, and come up with the best solutions. So, uh, there, as I mentioned, we cannot seem to apply uh, algorithmic innovations and architectural hardware innovations anymore, but we need to look at them in a framework, in a unified framework. And in that regard, we use des design space exploration. Uh, design space exploration very neatly identifies the trade-offs. For instance, if we use binary or two by two kernel, what is the implication of that in decoding algorithm? Or how do I puncture a code so that uh, these constraints are satisfied? So based on our requirements, um, uh, we carried out uh, an extensive design space exploration and identified the key design maps, the key design parameters for us. Um, in terms of architectural innovations, as I mentioned, the key premise here is, okay, how do we optimize the, uh, the uh, factor tree um, in order to improve the decoding latency and decoding throughput of the system? Um, one of the huge research focus is subtree trimming, identifying the subtrees so that the factor tree is significantly reduce in terms of size and number of nodes and operations. And finally, we obtain a factor tree, a simplified factor tree, where the performance is not much different than the original uh, highly complex uh, subtree. And once we have that, uh, flattening and uh, pipelining, this tree is rather straightforward. And it gives us um, a considerable improvement in terms of throughput and latency. So uh, this is like putting everything together. Uh, it's one of our papers, um, pretty much tying this algorithmic innovation with hardware innovation in this work. What we looked at is polar codes is a combination of smaller polar codes, which we call component codes in the, in the literature, identifying which component codes uh, contribute least to decoding performance is, is an important task. And we came up with an automated method to identify these uh, subcodes. And um, by a method called relaxation, we simply cancel or kill those subcodes, where if you if we see here, the performance degradation is almost zero. However, we reduce the complexity of the codes in this uh, automated fashion. Um, so that's, that's really combining the algorithmic innovation and the architectural innovation to enable uh, our, our design requirements. So uh, finally, in the slide set, I want to mention about the implementation side of the things um, with our partners. Uh, we partnered under a, U a European Union framework project called EPIC. Here is the link for further information. And with our design expert, ASIC design expert, mainly University of Stuttgart, Professor Norbert Winstein, uh, we have implemented uh, our architectural innovations and new code designs uh, based on already standardized 5GNR polar code, the MDB control channel, and also LDPC codes. So uh, the real innovation or, or advancement here comes from on-road decoder architectures, which I tried to emphasize in the previous slide. And what we observe is that uh, one of the first in the literature these designs achieve in polar codes 400 gigabit per second, 
decoder, whereas for LDPC, we uh, obtained about 347. And for a different number of iterations, again, 400. And unique, uh, uniquely, the total power we consume is in the order of one watt for polar codes for LDPC around five and eight watts. And energy efficiency is almost, almost uh, within our requirements. And this is the virtual silicon. That's a real implementation, real ASIC implementation in 14 nanometer. Uh, virtual silicon. Uh, here we see a polar decoder. It's 1.4 millimeter square, magnified obviously, and all these dots are showing our computational stages. And on the right hand side is the LDPC decoder with eight iterations, each color corresponding to an iteration. Uh, that is a 6.9 millimeter square solution, which consumes eight watts. So uh, we actually even advanced these solutions, and and the final designs of polar codes are already hitting terabit per second data rates. Um, just to make sure uh, timing, I think we have three minutes yeah, left, we, so I will probably- We have to talk about our, yeah, we have to talk about our, What would you think? Yeah, I, I think to, to take some questions, uh, sure. Uh, sure, we, we actually already have some questions in the Q&A, so- Sure, um, I'll just stop here then. Of course. Okay, well, thank Thanks you so for much. Listening. Thank you so much, Ono. This this was a, a really interesting talk. So um, so let me read some questions from the chat. Sure. So um, so what the first question we have is: Do you see OTFS as a candidate waveform for six uh, G technologies? Yeah, yeah. OTFS is actually very unique on combining all this Doppler effect and communications. It's absolutely a contender for six G, in my personal opinion. And we saw a lot of discussions in 5G and it will simply be more in 6G uh, standards discussion. So the answer is yes. Okay, next question we have is um, about polar codes. And um, do you think they're gonna be used in the data channel? And um, if so, at which uh, block lengths? And, and maybe if you can comment about block lengths common in the control channel as well. No, exactly. So currently it's up to about 50, very small, small length, obviously, for, for 5G. But there are recent designs of polar codes by Arikan again. Uh, it's convolutional polar codes, uh, PRCC, I guess, uh, the acronym. And we see about 100, 200 uh, bit, bit streams um, already showing considerable, considerable uh, performance. So in my opinion, for URLLC type applications, polar codes absolutely stand as a favorite, one of the favorites at least. And even for data channels, the, the implementations I show uh, are achieving terabit per second. So um, for black lanes, all the way from 100 bits to 1000 bits, I think polar codes stand significant chance. In terms of the block length, you think uh, the commonly commonly used block lengths will go up to the thousand bit uh, level? No, co the currently commonly used block lengths for uh, polar codes is about 128 bits. It's okay. not thousand bits, but there are methods. Again, that's the hardware innovation that I was alluding to. So with some hardware innovations, we are able to actually increase the the uh, you know we, we make some tweaks in the in the code length as well. Okay, gotcha. Uh, we have a question about um, about uh, frequencies, high frequencies, terahertz in particular. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, so you know, you, you've uh, you've mentioned terahertz, and um, you know, we've we've heard a lot about um, we've heard a lot about the uh, uh, abundant frequency spectrum above um, above in the hundreds of uh, gigahertz. That's right. Um, on the other hand, recent market movement in five G. Um, at least some of it seems to be focusing on sub six, sub six gigahertz. So um, can you square that? You know, do you think sure. that sub six is a shorter trend and, and uh, the very high frequencies are, are gonna have more impact years from now or uh, what do you yes. think is going on? Yeah, sub six gigahertz will always be the anchor bands. They are like the cream layer for us. So sub six gigahertz will always be the ultimate carriers. So millimeter wave and terahertz, they have very unfavorable propagation properties. They will rather be the supplementary bands for us. But once the transmitter and receiver have a line of sight, uh, six gigahertz can give you at most 100, 200 megahertz bands. But in terahertz, millimeter wave, we can get hundreds of gigahertz bands. So 
the data will be conveyed through a millimeter wave or terahertz in favor of favorable deployments or scenarios. But six gigahertz will always be there and will be the most critical spectrum. So no doubt about that. Gotcha. All right, well, uh, we're, we're actually over time now. So I'm afraid I'm gonna have to uh, uh, call an end to it, but I just want to uh, say uh, thank you very much to uh, InterDigital and uh, owner for this um, very interesting talk and uh, very wide ranging talk. It was, it was really interesting for, for me and I'm sure everyone else. And uh, thank you for coming here. Thank you very much for the invitation again. And I apologize for my voice. I think it's the allergy. Uh, I hope it wasn't very disturbing, but uh, thank you again for, for the invitation, Kyle. All right. It. All right, and good night, and good night. Right. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. So long.